Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second Women in GIS webinar based on the Esri Press series, Women in GIS, and hosted in partnership with We Can, Esri's Women Enablement and Career Advancement Network. I'm Stacy Krieg. I'm an acquisitions editor at Esri Press, and I'm also one of the writers of the book, along with Claudia Neighbor and Alicia Tornetta. And helping me out today behind the scenes are Madeline Shuren and Margot Borney, both with We Can's organization at Esri. We Can is an employee resource group at Esri focused on enabling women of all backgrounds to achieve their goals and build strong careers. And at this point, I would like to turn the presentation over to Margot so she can say a few words. Thanks, Stacey. My name is Margot Bordney, and I'm one of the leaders of the We Can community at Esri. Today, as we're coming together to celebrate and uplift women, and as a group that's focused around that mission, before we start, we feel compelled to pause and acknowledge the pain and outrage many of our attendees in the US and around the world are experiencing right now in response to acts of racism and tragic and unconscionable police violence against Black people in the US. We wanna speak up and share a message of empathy and solidarity with our Black community here in the US and around the world and condemn racism in every form. For those in the audience who are deeply and personally impacted by this, we want you to know that we see you and we stand in solidarity with you and your families and your communities. Finally, we wanna share that in light of these events, we've asked our presenter, Olivia Powell of the Avon and Somerset Police Department in the UK to refrain from doing her presentation today out of respect for anyone who may feel triggered by the topic of policing. She, along with us, expresses her solidarity and compassion for everyone who's been affected by racism and police brutality. Now, while we grieve together today, we also want to look ahead and allow ourselves to be inspired by the amazing work of women in our field to create a more just and sustainable world. So I'd like to now pass the presentation back to Stacey, who will introduce our speakers and at the end of the webinar, we'll close with some resources for how we can all support our Black colleagues in the U.S., as well as our colleagues of African and Caribbean descent in the geospatial field right now. Stacey. Thank you, Margot. That's really important to acknowledge. With this in mind, I'd like to introduce you to three inspiring women who are changing and improving our world with GIS. Today, we have Kelsey Leonard, Sianna Lena Williams, and Barbara J. Ryan, all of whom are featured in our newest book, Women in GIS Volume 2, Stars of Spatial Science. Each of these women have generously contributed to the book and have helped us to inspire and educate so many women about GIS and roles in the STEM field. I'm really proud and honored that they have decided to share some of their story and some of their work with us this morning. So a few housekeeping things. Before we start, you'll notice that there's a chat window either at the bottom or on the side of your screen. If you have any questions during the presentations, either for the group or for each presenter, please type them into the chat window. We'll be taking about 30 minutes at the end of all three presentations to ask our speakers questions. So our first presenter is Kelsey Leonard. As a water scientist and protector, Kelsey Leonard seeks to establish indigenous traditions of water conservation as the foundation for international water policy making. Dr. Kelsey Leonard represents the Shinnecock Indian Nation on the Mid-Atlantic Committee on the Ocean, which is charged with protecting America's oceans, ecosystems, and coastlines. She also serves as a member of the Great Lakes Water Quality Board on the International Joint Commission. Dr. Leonard has been instrumental in safeguarding the interests of indigenous nations for environmental planning and builds indigenous science and knowledge into new solutions for water governance and sustainable oceans. Kelsey, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you're all set, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you. Thank you to Stacy and the whole Esri publishing team for allowing me to be one of the presenters today. Um, 
I want to talk with you a little bit about my work in mapping indigenous water knowledges. And I have my Twitter handle there at the bottom, Kelsey T. Leonard, if you want to uh, live tweet along with this presentation. So I want to start with an acknowledgement um, in recognition of our solidarity uh, with Black Lives Matter, I think is really important that for myself as an Indigenous woman and an Indigenous scientist, our Indigenous sovereignty goes hand in hand with Black liberation. Uh, a lot of my work as a scientist, both um, within the fields of water and, and climate action, is very much working towards aspects of environmental and social justice that recognize that colonialism, oppression, genocide are still ongoing um, activities within our world and ongoing tactics by which we have our lives uh, continually impacted and suppressed uh, within what's currently known as uh, the United States and Canada and elsewhere in the world. So with that, I also want to start this presentation with a bit of a land acknowledgement. Um, so, so in my language, I'm from the Shinnecock Nation and our territory is located on what's currently known as Long Island um, in what's currently referred to as the state of New York. Uh, you can see here that this, uh, this particular website, nativeland.ca, is a great uh, space. Uh, it's still in development, but it's a great digital mapping tool by which you can go and find the territory that you currently sit on um, and, and reside on. And, and it's being updated constantly, and it's global in its perspective. So I also said in my acknowledgement and recognition of where I come from as a Shinnecock woman that I currently reside in the Great Lakes region um, of Canada, uh, what's currently known as Canada in Hamilton, Ontario, uh, which is on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee people. So I give thanks to them for allowing me to be here, to be a visitor, to be a researcher, um, and, and to work for the good for all of our peoples. That said, I mentioned to you that I'm from Shinnecock. Uh, this is a map uh, of our territory. Originally, uh, we're situated on the east end of Long Island, what we call Pominoc. Uh, and uh, this whole map, this whole area was our traditional territory um, and still is our ancestral territory. But what we currently have within our jurisdiction under uh, US and, and international law is the area that's outlined here in, in purple. And I'll go into more detail around that uh, later in, in this presentation. But I just wanted to highlight for you a bit of where I come from and my nation and our territory and that we're coastal water people, um, particularly where our territory is situated right now on what we call uh, the neck or the, the neck of our reservation is a peninsula that juts out into Shinnecock Bay and it's where fresh water meets salt water. And that's very much a part of how I formed my identity as an individual um, and also a, as a scientist. So a little bit about my background and to how I got into GIS and where I came from to, to get here. I did my undergrad at Harvard University, and then I went on to do my Master of Science in Water Science Policy and Management at the University of Oxford, um, where you can see the image in the center right is me um, during my uh, graduation ceremony, where I became the first uh, Native American woman to earn a science degree from the University of Oxford. Recognizing that a lot of um, the control of water and water rights is informed by law and our legal systems around the world. I went on to do law school in Pittsburgh where three rivers meet, um, in what we call the point, um, the Ohio, Monongahela, and Allegheny, and um, was, uh, did my, my law degree at Duquesne University School of Law. And then when I realized in going to law school that a lot of water law cases, indigenous environmental rights cases are cases of first impression and they rely a lot on secondary uh, literature and studies and research conducted by scientists um, and that there was a dearth of that when it came to indigenous peoples in our communities, I decided to go on to do my doctorate um, here in Canada at McMaster University in uh, the Department of Political Science focusing on indigenous water governance. Um, which I received my, my doctorate this past fall, and I'm now um, a postdoc and an instructor here at the university. 
So I have a very um, broad uh, academic background, but it's also very interdisciplinary with a focus on uh, advocating for indigenous rights, uh, water justice, and environmental justice. So you're probably asking yourselves, how did I come to the world of GIS? Well, for, for me, it was uh, through serving on uh, natural resources committees, so for a political appointment through my tribal nation, the Shinnecock Nation, um, where I was working in defense of land and water, uh, developing codes and looking at how we can have more uh, uh, policies for the protection of our waters and land uh, and lands on our territory. And at that point, that, that period in my life was also the time at which the United States was formulating a US national ocean policy with the purpose of coordinating, implement, uh, coordinating uh, to implement our regional ocean planning with um, interjurisdictional coordination of federal agencies, tribes, states, and fishery management council representatives. And um, my nation looked to me as a young scholar and an early career researcher and said, we want you to, um, to help us with this particular activity and to represent us on uh, the regional planning uh, capacities that were being developed. So I became a part of these regional planning areas, particularly the one in the mid-Atlantic that was focused um, in, in our part of the world, but also doing some related and crosswalking work in the Northeast. Um, again, these planning bodies were regional spaces for folks of different entities and legal jurisdiction to come together to try and figure out a way to protect our coast and ocean. And a big part of that was data. And so I got introduced to this massive world of mapping and GIS and um, realized that uh, there was, again, this dearth of information, a lack of information when it came to indigenous uses of the ocean in our particular region of the North Atlantic. And so I worked with the, um, a state consortium called MARCO, which is the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean, to try and partner with tribes along the eastern seaboard, particularly the mid-Atlantic and the northeast, to try and figure out how we could update the data portal to be reflective of geospatial data and imaginings of indigenous communities. And so that started with us having a dialogue with folks and then trying to think about how we could integrate traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge into geospatial data layers, and then trying to translate that, communicate that um, to practitioners and policymakers that now these data layers are going to exist or potentially exist within this portal. And they also are instances of best available data for um, practitioners and scientists to use to be making decisions about how to uh, manage our, our ocean and coastal resources. So, a big part of that work was recognizing, um, and I think this really plays into our current experience as people of color in the world, we've been erased and we've been made invisible. Um, there is a paper genocide that has occurred um, in, in our communities and around the world. And a lot of that is tied into GIS. It's tied into the geospatial um, mapping activities and mapping frames that are present in our world. And so, the first thing we had to do was actually even put indigenous people onto the portal and onto the map because our territories, our nations weren't even in the base layers of the mapping system. So that was a big activity that we undertook through this work. We also then had to think about well, what are areas of data and geospatial mapping uh, that are important to tribes, uh, First Nations in, in our territories and communities and region. And so these were some of the things that we wanted to highlight that weren't currently there. Impacts around climate change, impacts of marine management areas, impacts to our tribal fishing, our submerged cultural resources, because we've been here since time immemorial, which includes thousands of years, going back to uh, the previous ice ages. So the land and the water was so different thousands of years ago, and we have a connection to cultural resources that are now submerged in, in, in underwater archaeological sites that we still have a connection to and want to protect and, and preserve, especially when we think about modern instances of development in offshore energy, uh, particularly offshore wind that might disturb subsurface bottoms of, of our ocean. So 
we then said, okay, well, maps can help with this. In important part, it's about making sure that there are geospatial data layers available for our indigenous communities to be represented on the maps. But it's also not thinking just in the two dimensional, but how can we make sure our voices are being heard. And so through the portal, we also created Ocean Stories. So that has video and, and photos and, and sound and audio so that our indigenous knowledge holders could post things that they wanted the general public to know about how we view um, our oceans and, and how we view um, the restoration of our waters and, and protection of our non-human relations in, um, in our surrounding coastal areas. Um, we also made, uh, you know, took the opportunity to allow for folks to create custom maps and we did a lot of education about teaching folks about how to use the portal, how they could create their own maps and working particularly with tribal um, environmental managers to make sure that they knew that this tool was a resource for them. And in large part, that was predicated on an engagement process that we underwent using participatory GIS sessions to familiarize tribes with the portal, but then also to uh, work with them on mapping and creating spatial data layers that we could include in, into the portal um, with some caveats around uh, security and, and password protection. Given the legacy and, and trauma around the misuse and misappropriation of indigenous data for hundreds of years, if not longer, we really wanted to make sure that we were conscious of that. Um, we were conscious that open data is not necessarily um, the best practice for tribes and also requires a lot of education, both in terms of non-Indigenous folks, but also Indigenous folks in how to uh, really do open data in a way that is um, uh, culturally appropriate. So when we came out of this work, some best practices that we had um, around ocean mapping were really that we should have consultation, um, should be occurring with indigenous nations about the type of data and research priorities that we're setting. You should have indigenous authorization when you're digitizing and mapping things that are um, a resource and under the cultural intellectual property of an indigenous community. Um, and that requires training. We, are, we are, are not doing our due diligence in educating the, the future generations of geospatial scientists to recognize that indigenous communities have rights and there are, there are legal parameters through which um, we need to be accessing and understanding the ownership, control, and protection of indigenous data. Which led me into some of my current work around indigenous data sovereignty. There's a book here um, by um, Tahuku Kutai and John Taylor that you can download for free if this is something that you've never heard of before and you're really trying to think about how can you uh, make this a part of your uh, GIS work. Uh, more broadly, indigenous data sovereignty is the authority of indigenous nations um, under international law, notably the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, to manage the data on Indigenous peoples, our territories, cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, and ways of life. And for me, that includes a lot of our environmental data and particularly our ocean data. So I've been a part of a global uh, international research group uh, on data sovereignty, and we developed the CARE principle. So you may have heard of the FAIR principles, which some people have translated into, use, into being applicable to geospatial data, um, which is be fair, so make sure that the data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But as uh, we then say to go in second step and make sure it's and care, be fair and care, and make sure that you're accounting for indigenous people's collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. And you can find out more about these principles um, on the website listed here. So the big takeaway when it comes to indigenous data sovereignty is don't digitize indigenous knowledge without consent. So in my current work here in the Great Lakes, I have been particularly interested in mapping around indigenous water governance. Um, and so if you go, this is a really interesting tool. It's a georeferencer tool where you can look at contemporary maps and overlay historical maps. Um, it was a place where I started when I was in, trying to think about the interdisciplinary applications of GIS to my work around policy and uh, environmental policy and governance. And so if you look at, again, the base maps today, they erase indigenous peoples, our territories, and our nations. But if you overlay them with some historical maps, 
at some point, you know, 500 years ago, and I think this should load shortly, hopefully, for you, there we go. At 500 years ago, we were on the map. You can see here that it says the village of, of Huron, it says Six Nations, it says Tuscarora, it says all of the indigenous nations and villages that were part of this region of the Great Lakes. But it's somewhere along the way through digital colonialism and paper genocide, we have been erased from the maps. So that's been a big part of my contemporary work is to try and rescale our understanding of maps and mapping to be inclusive of our indigenous nations and territory. So this is a map that I created as a part of my uh, current work in indigenous water governance in the Great Lakes. Uh, it's for the Great Lakes drainage basin and each of those stars represents an indigenous nation um, that sits, that's situated within the drainage basin and has a right and responsibility to the protection of the Great Lakes. There's over 200 uh, indigenous nations within the basin that often go unaccounted for in studies and in research because we're left off the map so no one thinks we exist. So that's a big part of my current work. I try to integrate that now also into the classroom by doing story maps. Um, so these are some story maps that my students created using the Esri story map, free applications online related to indigenous water rights in different countries around the world. We partnered with a nonprofit. Um, they developed reports, country reports on uh, indigenous human rights abuses, particularly around water that would go to the office of the high commissioner um, for human rights at the United Nations for the universal periodic review. Um, they did reports on countries such as Mexico, Dominica, uh, Norway for uh, the Sami, Kalinago and other indigenous peoples. Um, there were about 30 reports that we submitted in all as a classroom activity. Um, and then to make it more accessible to the public, they made these, um, they translated their reports into story maps. So you can just kind of see these are some close ups of their maps. So where am I going now as, as I sort of close out my presentation? Um, I'm really interested in my current work is, is situated around climate change and rising sea levels. Uh, the images that you see here are um, my uh, First Nations territory, our Shinnecock territory. Um, this is it currently, um, again, a peninsula that sits out into the bay um, ad um, adjacent to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and But this also shows the next image that you will see is uh, the impact that rising sea level will have, whether that's one foot or six feet, you can see that we are, are in very much uh, extreme danger of rising seas. And so my climate change research is looking at the ways in which that impacts our water infrastructure and other um, aspects of our uh, political and economic sustainability. So I want to leave you with where I see GIS going in the future for us as, as Indigenous peoples, particularly Indigenous women. When I um, was really at the, I think maybe the height, but the beginning of my PhD, I saw the social media campaigns for women scientists, right? Women in Science, uh, the International Women in Science Day, Women and Girls in Science Day. And there, were, there was no indigenous representation. It was like, again, we were in this constant space of being erased. And so I started this honor roll uh, with um, honoring uh, the first woman that I, that I put on to, to Twitter using the hashtag IndigFemSci, which stands for Indigenous Women Scientists Leading in STEM, STEAM, and Indigenous Knowledge Systems, was Mary Golda Ross. Um, she's Cherokee, and she was the first Native American woman aerospace engineer. Um, you know, very instrumental in a lot of the, the early um, uh, accomplishments of NASA. And uh, she's since uh, been highlighted by Google. She's potentially going to be on a US dollar coin. And um, you can go and follow this hashtag and see a whole honor roll of amazing indigenous women from around the world, um, or, or those who identify as indigenous women from around the world, who are doing just such fantastic work in, in STEM. And many of those folks also include uh, geospatial scientists. And so that's where I see uh, the future being in, in honoring our living and existing heroes in science. So Tabutni, thank you. And I'll turn it back over to the team for our next presenter. Wow, thank you, Kelsey. That was really interesting and informative. And um, thank you for, for sharing that with us. Um, just, I just want to remind everybody that if you have questions, please, you know, put them in um, as the pre presenter is talking and we can um, save them for the end. 
And also I see that there's a question about whether this webinar is being recorded or not. It is being recorded and it will be available um, probably about a week after uh, today. So we will definitely um, be posting that through social media and we'll let everyone know um, who's signed up for the webinar where they can find that. So again, thank you so much, Kelsey. Um, and we're gonna go to our next presenter. So our next presenter is Sianna Lena Williams. Sianna Lena Williams is a GIS technician as well as the co-founder of African Women in GIS. She currently works as a GIS mapping specialist in the Route to Market team at Voltic Ghana Limited, which is a subsidiary of Coca-Cola Beverages Africa. There she creates efficient delivery route maps for product distributors and helps to manage the company's geo business data. She's an advocate for women in STEM and GIS. And in addition, as a LinkedIn coach, she teaches people the importance of self-branding as well as self-development skills and strategies. She's an active member of Women in Geospatial and Developers in Vogue. So, Sianna, if you're ready, we're gonna hand it over to you. Sure, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to reach out to my fellow people on the ongoing issue and the movement. I would like us to kind of come in and listen in on this presentation. Today, I'd like to reach out to kind of motivate our upcoming generation as Africans and want to kind of reach out to especially your daughters to kind of motivate them that these are some of the fields that they can actually take part in because we are in it and they can also go into it if they have the interest. So today I would like to talk about creating awareness for geo business in Africa and building the African women in GIS community. So first of all, I'd just like to share my story. Hopefully this will motivate others and motivate uh, upcoming GIS youth in taking up the step to further their interest in GIS or any other STEM field. So first of all, I actually got inspiration into geography from my brother's high school textbook. He is actually five years ahead of me. So when he was in high school, I was in primary school. So I got interested in it and it kind of motivated me to kind of look forward to watching National Geographic Channel and anything that is geo-related. And this kind of moved me and the interest actually grew in me. And through junior high, I kept paying attention to the geography aspect of social studies because that was what was catching my attention all the time. So I realized I had this interest and that kind of influenced my decision to follow that course in high school. So in the high school I got, I actually wanted to combine science with geography. Unfortunately, my school did not have that option. And my mom wanted me to further elective science. However, I decided to choose geography. So here's a picture of me preparing to write my examinations to enter the university. I know my West African English country um, brothers and sisters will actually know this exam. So further down the line, in university, that's actually when I got further exposure to geography and its vast applications. And that was when I found GIS and remote sensing. This was during my third year when I was looking through the elective courses I had to select. I was fortunate enough to research into it and actually get more information. And when I realized that it was a combination of two things I actually loved, that was geography and technology, I decided to take it up full time. So that kind of motivated me to further add it to my undergraduate research. Although I had just a few weeks to submission, I decided to kind of add GIS to my research because I felt that that would actually give it more um, proof and more validity to show what I actually did my research on. So my research was on urban sprawl and water supply and urban Accra, and I decided to add that, to add the remote sense aspect of it. So in this map, you can see that I actually looked for the images or the satellite images of these six communities. 
So my study area covered six communities. And these are the communities that you see on your screen. So in the three year span in one map, I was able to kind of show the gradual expansion of the city from the core to the peri-urban. So we have the core, the mid-core and the peri-urban. So the peri-urban are the outskirts that are the rural areas that are now turning into kind of mid-core areas or cities. So further down the line, after my university period, I decided to take up um, my national service. In Ghana, we actually have one year service to the state. And I decided to take that one year service with a GIS and software company called Hanson Geodata. I had actually taken up an internship opportunity there and I was called back to come and offer my one year service. So when I got there, I was able to take up so many roles and this was because it was a startup. So I'm here with my colleague, he's Benoit, and he actually worked with me as well as with Joel and Justice. And over there, I took up so many roles, administrator, GIS technician, program manager, and project coordinator in just one year. So through that, I actually went ahead to learn programming with developers in Vogue. And I also represented a company at a competition in South Africa and Uganda and we were able to win our first prize, which was the third prize of Frontier Innovation Award. And I further went ahead to come to work with my current workplace as Vaulted Ghana Limited, where I'm trying to help them apply GIS to their food and beverages business. So I'll get into that a little bit after. Then I further went ahead to teach LinkedIn because I realized that one issue I use have an issue with especially in Africa, is that they do not know how to brand themselves in, in time for the job market. They just put themselves out there, but you actually have to brand yourself to stand out and to actually build the skills that you need to stand out and complementary skills to what you already know or what you learned in school. So I further decided to grow as a speaker to share the knowledge and to also teach more about GIS because I realized that it's a low awareness um, topic and it decided, we decided that we had to take this up. So I, on the personal hand, decided to take it up and talk about it. So after a while, I decided to de develop a community. At first I had it for only Ghana, but then I met Chidima online and then we decided to put up this platform that's African Women in GIS. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then I further joined Women in Geospatial. So I am currently trying to push the agenda of GIS in Africa, especially its vast applications, and also to kind of groom more ladies to take it up because I, for one, never knew about GIS until I was in my third year in university. Imagine if I had never heard about this, where would I have been? So next, I'd like to take up um, the topic of geobusiness. This is actually a field that some people do not know about. In fact, most people, they already do not know about GIS and they definitely do not know that they can use it in business. We know that GIS can be used in environmental studies, spatial analysis. However, have you ever thought about bringing that spatial analysis to your business using actual GIS tools to derive business insights? So here I would like to use this platform to create the awareness, especially for African businesses to employ and also to apply these GIS technologies in their business strategies. This can go a long way to help us improve our systems as well as our businesses. So first of all, I'd like to take up for the food and beverages industry because that's where I'm currently working in. And there, these are some of the factors that you'd have to consider. So first of all, you'd have to consider the industry. So as I said, I'm going to take up food and beverages. In this industry, you'd have to pay attention to what the company wants to achieve and the kind of insights they would like to get. So you'd have to consider the indicators, that's the market indicators they use to base the analysis. And with that, you can develop the data collection tool, the data collection form. So this will help the data collectors to get the right data that they need to make the informed decisions. So based on that data that is collected, which is actually the costly part of the project, you then go ahead to divide the market area. So as a company, you must know the area 
or the region of any part of the country that you'd like to base your business and where you'd like to serve or provide the customers with your products. And with that, you just go ahead to de develop the divisions of where you'd like to mark as um, a specific category for your business. And based on that, you can get more insights and better understanding. And you can get more insights on how to kind of compare your areas and know which area needs more resources as compared to the others. So in this case, um, as you can see, this is a sample map I made to kind of show or give an idea of how you can divide your market area. So this is one territory. So taking into consideration that the data has already been collected and based on the data and the indicators that were collected, we decided to divide the area into two. So here you can see the overall map. And here on the bigger map, you can see the selected area, which is the business territory A. So going down, we'll then go on to see exactly some of the things that you can use your data for, some of the business insights you can derive. So for an FMCG company, that is fast, um, fast moving consumer goods company, food and beverages are usually the number one. So for that, you actually have to consider the amount of products your customers buy. And with this, you can do a visualization using um, Axis. I use Axis online. You can use any other visualization tool to kind of get an understanding. It can be based on a time basis. You can check your data and you can visualize it by month or per week or per day. It depends on how you collected the data. So as I indicated earlier, you have to know what the company wants and the kind of data they would like to get and the kind of insights they would like to get from your data. So this will influence a lot of decisions and a lot of things that you'd like to take up. So this is a sample map. Um, the data is actually not right because um, I had to get my own data because no company will provide their data firsthand or would like to give you their data. It's always confidential, as is my work. Okay, so as you have understood this, this can help you to get a more understanding of the concentration of your customers per area and also understand the amount of products that your customers buy. So this can help you get an overall view. So if you're given a presentation, this is much more understanding than only giving graphs and numbers. You have to give people some form of visuals to kind of appreciate your data more. And this is a way of doing so. So as you can see, this is business territory one, and this, this is business territory B, and this is business territory A. So moving on. After you have derived all the insights you want to do, and you have developed your territories, you further have to develop your delivery routes. Now, this is a fundamental aspect of most food and beverages companies because this is the part where you have to deliver. And even this can be applied to any other industry where you would have to provide your products to the customer. So first of all, you can develop the delivery routes and this can be based on any number that you would like to provide to a driver who can provide it at a specific time. So each day and the area that the driver would have to attend to and would have to provide a customer with your products. So you'd have to take into consideration time traffic and so many other factors that can come in so this is the aspect where i would like to encourage that whenever you are having this kind of system applied to your business you would have to consider having a software base that is customized to your company there you can apply real-time traffic tracking as well as real-time tracking of your uh, goods in the car so you can have some form of um track system that will be Im implanted in the car and also a system that you can help easily uh, record your sales per day. So the driver would just have to move according to what the system tells him. I mean, where the system tells, tells him to move to. And in this map, you can see I tried to kind of create a route to show how the driver would move along and deliver to each customer. And this was based on the shortest route. So here is where you can actually apply 
such technologies to a software with a map base to help to efficiently deliver your products to your customers. It can also help to track the sales per day, per month, per week. And even after all that information has been collected, you can further make insights and projections for your business. So these kind of applications into businesses is what I would like to encourage so that it can also create more avenues for people with my skill in Africa to get some form of employment and it can also add to your knowledge of data science and other related courses and fields. So just remember that once you have a business that relies on location, GIS can definitely be applied and integrated in your business strategy. So moving on, I'd like to talk a bit about African women in GIS. We are a new community. We were established officially in October 2019. And this community was actually made up of um, my, uh, my co-founder, that's Chidima Umiogu from Nigeria. She developed her community for Nigeria, and I developed mine for Ghana. But mine was a little young, so we had just a few members. But she had quite a number of members from Nigeria, and I know some of my members are watching right now. So as you can see, African Women in GIS came about because Chidima and I actually had a conversation on LinkedIn, and that's where we, we actually met. So we were both just talking about how it's difficult to find jobs in GIS and how it's difficult to even know other ladies who are offering GIS. Because I, for one, I do not know the number of ladies who are still furthering GIS. Even the guys who were in my class in my undergraduate studies, I do not know how many are still furthering GIS. And it's, it's an issue because um, it's actually a very futuristic field that we are definitely going to benefit from. So in this case, we realized that the issue is not really knowing where to go after school and not knowing what to do or how to even enter into the field professionally because it's very new, people don't know about it, and even the job opportunities are super limited. So we decided to create this community to kind of address that problem as well as also to try and help Africa to understand the different applications of GIS. So even though it's an unfortunate event, this pandemic has actually helped us to come out and to be shown on TV screens, news stations everywhere, and being shown to people that this is how you can actually apply GIS in the health sector. And now we'd like to help people to understand that you can apply that same technology in businesses and in other aspects. So first of all was the level of awareness, which was actually already an issue, and then the lack of knowledge of the vast applications on the side of employers. So the limitations and the problems actually led us to create this amazing platform that I'm so glad that we have done this and we are getting more ladies and we are open to more ladies and we are hoping to get more of them to benefit from this program because we would like to motivate more African ladies to take it up, especially those who are in school. We would want to make them understand that there are communities like this that they can benefit from, not only get the job opportunities and others, but actually get mentors, GIS advice, and all that that you actually need in your career. So concerning the activities, um, just recently, we had an International Women's Day webinar, which was our first webinar, which was actually honored by Dr. Don Wright from Esri and Dr. Catherine Nakalimbi from NASA Harvest. We also had um, an, an interaction with AfriSnet, that's an organization that aims to kind of connect African students with STEM professionals across the world and kind of create opportunities for Africans to further their postgraduate opportunities in STEM courses. So this was honored by Dr. Gabriel Guiana and Dr. Daniel Schwab. And we are also having a Python coding class that is ongoing by, with Benda, who is actually leading us. And we are also currently having our mentorship program. So we have so many activities that we have in mind for the, for the members. And these activities were actually inspired by the members. So as you join, we ask you your expectations. And through that, we try to provide them. So these are some of the plans that we have for the future, and we are hoping to do more. Unfortunately, because of the current pandemic, we actually could not go out to have 
um, physical outreaches to our, our ladies or our um, sorry, the girls in school or even the guys to kind of just show them that look, if you continue with geography, you can actually enter this technological field. So I keep telling people that GIS is just a technological aspect of geography. So once we get to get them interested, it makes it more easier for people to get um, involved in this field and it might also open up avenues for opportunities for them to also get job opportunities. So these are some of the ways that as a community we are trying to kind of involve more people and to open up the field to more um, of the youth who are interested and would like to further such a STEM field. So you can follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter and we would also share a link on our platforms, that's LinkedIn and Twitter, that will help you to kind of join our community if you're interested and we are definitely open to having you on our team. So thank you so much for this opportunity and I wish you a good day. Uh, thank you, Sienna. That was really great. That was so uplifting and, and amazing to try to get other women and people into GIS. So we really appreciate you talking with us today. Thank you. Thank you. So our last presenter is Barbara J. Ryan. Under Barbara J. Ryan's leadership, millions of satellite images and other Earth observation data has been made available to the general public at no charge allowing scientists, planners, and policymakers to make better informed decisions on problems that transcend political boundaries. Her work addresses critical issues in agriculture, biodiversity, climate change, disaster planning, energy, health, and water. Barb has had an amazing career starting in 1974 when she joined the USGS, the nation's largest natural resource science and civilian mapping agency. From 2008 to 2012, she was director of the WMO space program. And from 2012 to 2018, she was the secretariat director of the Intergovernmental Group on Earth Observations in Geneva, Switzerland. So Barb, we're honored to have you here. And if you're ready, we'll turn it over to you. Great, well, listen, thank you. Thanks, Stacy. And let me just add uh, my appreciation to like the other speakers have to the sponsors and and also the participants. Um, it looks like we've got about 300, maybe 325 folks online. So welcome everyone. Um, and I guess I'd just like to also put in a plug for the book, you know, as you go through that, uh, my goodness, there are stories of accomplishments of 30 women in that book and, and each one has a story to tell. So uh, again, thanks for pulling that together. Um, I guess, um, let's see, I'll try and um, I, I, I realized um, for a, a better slide, a better title for this particular slide might have been 68 years and 68 seconds. <laughs> but anyway, this is kind of uh, it, me at a glance. We'll, we'll go down the left hand side of the slide and then work our way along the bottom and up the right hand side. I was born in Dalton, New York, which actually is a town of about 300 people. And as Kelsey was um, putting her maps up of all the indigenous areas in uh, western, I was western New York. Um, it, Dalton was actually in the Genesee River Basin, which is pretty close, maybe contiguous with the Tuscarora uh, indigenous areas that Kelsey mapped. Um, the Genesee River goes right through a park called Letcher State Park, and it's funny that I ultimately ended up working for the Geological Survey because we often co coined um, Letcher State Park, the Grand Canyon of the East. Um, I got a bachelor's degree in geology from Cortland State University, a uh, master's in civil engineering from Stanford, and then a master's in geography from the University of Denver. And I, I guess what I have to say is that um, you'll see a little bit later on that my inter I mean, geography is a really integrating, uh, integrating science. And so my work has largely been on kind of the policy or the data side as compared to many of you probably on the phone and certainly the other speakers that are really talented from a GIS perspective. I mean, I know the tool and know what it can do for the community, but 
um, but I'm, I'm, a lot of my work has been upstream of the act, that piece of technology. Uh, as Stacy said, yeah, I spent 34 years with the Geological Survey, four with WMO, and then uh, six with uh, the Group on Earth Observations. Those last two assignments were in Geneva, Switzerland, so we moved back about a year and a half ago when I retired from GEO. Um, you know, uh, for, uh, this is a picture of uh, Thanksgiving uh, family. Um, my, uh, we have one son, Thomas Muldoon, and uh, he married a young French French woman. And this is her family and our family getting together for Thanksgiving. And then um, lastly, I do sit on the Jane Goodall Board of Directors, and you'll notice again in the edition of this book, edition edition of this book that Jane actually wrote a foreword for the book. So I've got a couple other assignments. One, I'm policy advisor for the World Geospatial Industry Council, sit on a number of advisory uh, committees and councils, some European projects and the International Symposium for Remote Sensing in the Environment. So I'm keeping pretty busy in retirement, uh, um, but still, uh, still having a lot of fun. Um, I think when I talk about being on the data side, and if I had to characterize myself, it really is as an advocate for open data. And again, I very much appreciated hearing Kelsey's perspective on um, open data is good, but not always for all people. And so I guess what I'm talking about is that um, uh, certainly um, we want to protect uh, personal privacy information, and I understand that for uh, many indigenous peoples, that's actually larger over their entire grounds, not just their own personal information. Um, what you're going to see from these next couple slides is my experience has been largely with the Landsat program, when, of course, when I was with the um, U.S. Geological Survey, if you, who operated the Landsat satellites, uh, NASA launches, builds and launches the satellites and the USGS operates them. If you look at this graph, it only goes from about 2008 to 2017, but the first Landsat satellite was launched back in 1974. And so um, for 30 plus years, 1974 to 2008, uh, we sold Landsat data. When the government sold the imagery, it was four or $500 a scene. When the private sector sold the imagery in the mid 80s with Landsats four and five, it was four or $5,000 a scene. And yet when we did some analysis in the 2000, I moved into the job of Associate Director for Geography and had responsibility for the program in about 2000 or 2001. And so we started really looking at that whole business model. And when you looked at the business model, uh, we were selling 53 scenes a day. Um, now, 53 scenes a day, four or $500 a scene, 365 days a year. I mean, we were bringing in a chunk of change, you know, it was four and a half or $5 million a year, uh, which is substantial for any agents, any organization. But when you looked at who was buying that data, who, who were buying those 53 scenes a day, number one, other federal agencies, a lot out of the Department of Agriculture. Number two, uh, universities, largely funded through the National Science Foundation. And number three, contractors funded by the Defense Department. So we were really just taking money out of one pocket and putting it into another and all those organizations along the line were incurring administrative costs to track the purchasing and um, you know, selling of that data. So we said, listen, just give it away. Just put it, the technology is now sufficient that we can put it up over the web, just do it. Well, you know, as you might imagine, it took quite a while to um, have that take root. Uh, clearly, you had to sell it within your own organization, USGS, the Department of Interior, the Office of Management and Budget, uh, the White House, OSTP, and then ultimately the Hill. But uh, we were able to get it done in 2007, get the policy changed so that we could distribute it over the web uh, at no incremental cost to the user. 
And here's what happened. We went from 53 scenes a day to 5,700 scenes a day. Now this was in 2017. To this day, that many scenes are being downloaded. In fact, I think it's actually even higher than that. Um, but it's not just uh, download numbers. Um, we speculated that if we were able to release that data broadly and openly, you would be able to have an annual economic benefit. And some work that was done in 2011, I had since left the organization to go to Geneva. Um, these are the data from that study. Uh, $1.7 billion of economic return to the US, $400 million international, globally outside the US for a global total of $2.1 billion obviously far exceeding the four and a half or five million dollars that we were taking in as as one single agency and so this is a pretty remarkable story and i think if you needed updated statistics the geological survey has them i think uh, the u.s number is now over two billion uh, the international number i think is up around five or six hundred million dollars bringing the global total uh closer to 2.5 billion dollars a year so in in general a, a good story economically but you know in listening to uh cyana talk uh today it's not just about the economic benefit either um let me show you some work that australia has done in something called a data cube they ingested the entire landsat archive 1974 right up to the future uh, right up to the present um, of data in that archive and then instead of looking at it from a scene by scene basis they looked at it from a pixel by pixel basis so 25 meters by 25 meters for the entire continent of Australia and then what they said is, well, listen, as long as we've got 25 meters by 25 meters for the entire continent through time, let's go back and look at, let's superimpose a water algorithm over the entire data set and look at these pixels that have always been wet, always been dry, uh, or something in between. And this is what you see in this particular graph. So basically, well, in this case, they took 27 years of data, your 25 meter pixel resolution, 300,000 scenes. If you were to buy that at four, or $500 a scene, you know, it'd be the um, third of the cost of the satellite. You just didn't do these regional or global assessments before you had broadly and openly a data uh, data. So a lot of data and they got it down into three hours of compute time. So continental uh, observations from space. And um, you know what, we need this for every continent. Um, there are some efforts going on in Africa right now called the African Open Data Cube. I can give you contacts for that if you would like it. Like it largely uh, a group that I'm on an advisory committee for, uh, Adita Agarwal for Data for uh, D for D Insights, is in a coordination role. But um, you know what? So we we ought to have this not just state by state or watershed by watershed, but we really need it for the entire globe. And whether you put it into your own supercomputer like Australia did, or whether you put it into a cloud, uh, like I think what's happening in Africa, the, the point is you wanna be able to look at change over time. And it doesn't just have to be for water, it could be for any landscape change. So again, when Cyana was talking about urban growth or forest change or whatever, um, we ought to have these kinds of analyses at our fingertips. And I'd argue that broad open data, certainly for the resolution of data that we're talking about with Landsat or the European Sentinel series is just uh, so, so, uh, so, so important. So we're often find of fond of saying countries have borders, earth observations don't. 
might also tie that into how we started this whole uh, series, which is uh, countries have uh, borders, but solidarity doesn't. And so I'll uh, I'll end there. We'll turn it uh, I'll turn it back to Stacy for any um, uh, questions that all of you have. Uh, thank you again. Uh, here's my email address and the uh, Twitter uh, handle. Thanks, Stacey. I'm going to turn it back to you and go back on mute. Okay. Thank you so much, Barb. That was really great. I appreciate everybody's participation. Um, all three of those um, presentations were amazing. Um, I think we're going to take some questions now. We do have a bunch of questions coming in. So. Let's see, um, bear with me. I'm going to kind of go through these as they have come. Um, the first question is for Kelsey. Kelsey, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> okay, so um, this is from Stephanie Arsenault. It asks, have you ever worked with other government agencies to include bathmetric and topography data? I will say that um, it's something that we are interested in working on. Um, we have had some partnerships uh, through the Shinnecock Nation with USGS. Um, we I've had some very fruitful partnerships because of my involvement in the regional planning bodies um, with NOAA. So um, we're we are looking at other types of, of data um, and and spatial information in terms of integration. Um, and then that also is translated into some of the work that I'm I'm doing at the Great Lakes. So so I guess the short answer is, is yes, um, but also looking to do more and, and hopeful that. Um, I'm, I'm not a one woman show, right? That we actually can get some of this work to be integrated across all of the federal agencies um, and that they're taking on sort of the fair and care principles, um, both in the US and Canada uh, and implementing it, you know, in their own work um, and hopefully, you know, coming to us and saying, hey, what do you think of this, of this data product, you know, um, so that uh, they're doing a bit of the heavy lifting as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um... So this is a question I think for everyone. Um, as a GIS employee in a municipality, what's your advice about how you can improve skills and story mapping and how do you use story mapping? And, and I guess anyone can weigh in if, if they're um, inclined to. Well, this is uh, Kelsey. I will just say, as, as I showed in my presentation, it's really important that we start to introduce the different types of technology and platforms available for story mapping to students early on. I've seen um, different capacities uh, it, it utilized for high school age students. Um, I know that ESRI has had a few competitions at different levels for practitioners, for undergraduate students, for high school students. Um, start your own type of competition even, um, assign it in a classroom. But for me, a big part of, of my pedagogy as an instructor was trying to introduce new forms of, of uh, activities for students to get involved that are also practical, that will have real life applications for their careers later on. And so story maps are a great tool. So I would just say a big part of it is integrating that into our education system. Okay, thanks. Anyone else have any comments on the use of story maps? I, Sienna, I know you used yours for your presentation today. Oh, maybe we have yeah. lost her. There you um, go. Yeah, so um, I actually learned how to use story maps on my own. I'm the kind of person who likes to play around softwares and kind of learn how to use them. So you can task yourself to create um, themes that you'd like to create story maps on, then kind of gradually watch a few videos on how to use them and also just start creating um, your own story map. So it's actually free to sign up to make your own story map and you can do that with, I think, access online to kind of mm -hmm. get access to that. So it's free, you can just go online and just start to play with it, watch videos about it, and you will definitely be able to use it. Great, thank you. Um, so let's see. 
Um, there's a question for Siana. Um, is it possible to use um, GIS? in education field and this person's asking about uh, lower grades so have you ever had any experience working in um, schools or kindergarten that's what it looks like they're asking okay um unfortunately not uh but that was actually part of the plan for uh african women in gis community to kind of showcase the software to um children of all ages but um yeah, I think it's something that would have to look into that's post corona to kind of get mm -hmm. that running. So we haven't yet started that and we are yet to do so. Right. I know we're trying to get GIS into the lower grades. So I might jump in on that. This is Barb. Yeah. Hi. Yes. So I don't know of any applications of GIS in those lower grades, but what I do want to say is uh, particularly for any educators on the line it is just so important to get the kids outside because i know for me growing up and i talked about this in the book a little bit and jane goodall actually talked about it in her forward is that her her, her love really certainly mine for geography really came at a very very early age just being out kind of playing in the creek or looking at the connections that actually happen um, out on the in out outdoors, and so um, while it may not be a specific question to GIS, I do know that kids have an, a tremendous ability to integrate uh, across systems if they could just go outside and see the connections that you see every day. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. This is Kelsey. I'll, I'll add there too. Um, one of the things that we've been working on here in the Great Lakes region with um, some community leaders and elders from Indigenous communities are um, Mother Earth Water Walks. And there's a program that an elementary school teacher out of Thunder Bay, Ontario, started to honor the sort of larger water walk program um, called Junior Water Walkers. So you can Google Junior Water Walkers and search the hashtag. Um, and it's a whole program about restoring our connection to water and uh, how to understand indigenous epistemologies uh, of connecting to water. Uh, but one of the really cool things that I've done in my instruction and that I've seen other educators do is use a mapping app when you take your students out into the environment um, and are doing a water walk or walking in nature. And then that mapping app will track your, uh, your walk or your location. And then you can take that back and upload it into the classroom and show students um, some more different sort of overlays of geospatial layers in addition to what they want. Um, and it's a really cool way to sort of get them interested in data and science. Wow, that sounds like a great program. Very cool. Thank you. Um, so we've got a question for Barb. Um, this is from Dawn, right? Actually, here at Esri. Um, she says, thanks for mentioning the wide world of data cubes. Can you for explain further the linkage between the Africa Data Cube project and perhaps Digital Earth Africa and Africa GeoPortal? Yeah. Hello, Dawn. Um, great hearing from you. And I'm probably not the best one to uh, ask that question because um, when I was in GEO, the, in the executive director, um, it, we were just, one, the Australian data cube was just coming in. And so obviously we, you know, launched the vision that this is absolutely wonderful for, for Australia, but we need it for every continent and we need it globally. And that's when uh, Adita, and a number of people, Australia with some support and some leaders out of Africa got together. I wanna to mention Andiswa Melissa in Sansa down the space agency down in South Africa, got together and formed a consortium. And so I'll tell you, I mean, what I would do is um, for anybody that wants to get more information on it, drop me a line and I'll do the homework in the background to get you to the right person who can talk about the evolution of each one of those components that you've talked about, because they may be different names for the same exact effort, okay? 
Great, thank you. Um, thanks for offering to help with that as well. That's terrific. Um, so we have a question for Kelsey. Um, can you expand a little bit on the issues surrounding open data and the preservation of indigenous data rights? How much time do you have? <laughs> I think this is where I would start. But I would I would say that um, there, at least within what's currently known as the United States and Canada, there are over um, a thousand indigenous nations uh, that are in a government to government, nation to nation relationship with the governments of the United States and Canada. Uh, there are also other sort of numerous hundreds of other indigenous communities uh, uh, across North America. Um, with each with their own distinct philosophies and rights and understandings of data governance and have the authority to determine the way in which their data should be used and should be made available to the public in the context of, of, an, of open data platforms. And so I think what we're advocating for is that each of those nations and communities, you know, per their rights and distinctions under international law, have the ability to determine their level of participation in, in, in open data um, and in the, the um, proliferation of, of open data policies. Uh, because currently right now, sort of the, the opposite of that, what's the sort of status quo, is that uh, the settler or state governments are making the determinations without the consultation of indigenous nations, for the most part. They're getting better, um, but through a lot of provocation from uh, global indigenous uh, data networks, uh, like the US Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network, there's Maori Data Sovereignty Network out of New Zealand and Australia, and they've, they're emerging globally to really start to affirm our rights because they haven't been adequately um, accounted for in the development of open data policies and, and, and open data governance practices uh, globally. So we're seeing a shift, but we still need to do more. And a lot of that starts with education and, and folks like yourself signing on for today's webinar to learn more. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, I, it's for Sienna, but um, I think maybe um, all of you might um, be able to chime in. Um, what should I keep in mind when influencing women in using GIS and explaining its importance in the practical field? Okay, that's, that's actually a good question. <laughs> well, um, you definitely have to consider where you are your location and the real world um what's actually happening in the real world because as i said it's a little difficult to get jobs in gis most of them are project based so what you'd have to do is kind of um allow the person to explore complementary skills as well and not to really limit herself to just gis but actually the extensions of gis so we have data science in gis we have surveying, we have, there are so many fields that you can apply GIS in. So allow that person to kind of discover exactly the field he or she is very interested in and to see how he or she can actually apply GIS. So there has to be a lot of research to be done. So that's the number one thing, a lot of research and then self-discovery to know exactly the field you'd like to go into. Thank you. I think that's my question. Okay. Was that a question? Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's a great piece of advice. Thank you so much. Um, uh, this one's for Barb, um, and I guess you, anyone else can chime in as well. What is the biggest lesson in your career, and what advice would you give to the next generation? Yeah, that's... Um... <laughs> That's a great question because in a way it actually ties in with the last question for me and that's that you've got to find your you've got to find your voice. You know, I think uh, at least for me and, and maybe for a lot of uh, young girls and women, um, we grow up maybe just not trusting ourselves or trusting our intuition. And uh, when you realize that uh, you think about problems kind of the same way that everybody thinks about problems, and oftentimes it takes somebody else to ask it. How many times did you sit in a classroom, somebody else asked a question, and you said, you say to yourself, geez, I had that same question, but you kind of were afraid to ask it, you know? 
And so I think just um, finding your voice and learning to trust yourself is just so important and speaking up um, because if you're thinking something, dollars to donuts, somebody else is too. And then I guess the only other piece of advice is, um, you know what, we learn, I learn way more from my failures <laughs> than I ever have uh, from any success. So, uh, you know, that old uh, adage about uh, good decisions come from experience and experience uh, comes from bad decisions <laughs> is so true. And so don't uh, don't be afraid of uh, failing uh, because you'll learn way more from those than you will uh, your successes. Thanks. That's great. Um, and this is sort of uh, tagging onto that question. Um, someone asked too, what would be the best advice that you could give a recently graduated woman who's starting out their professional career? And I guess this is to anyone can answer that one. This is uh, Kelsey. I would say that it's really important to, I, you know, I think what was mentioned earlier about not limiting yourself and being open to, to new possibilities or things that you didn't necessarily think were, you know, in your discipline. Um, I think what we, what I encourage folks to do is think outside your discipline, think about how you can you know, translate your discipline to, to other disciplines and encourage that interdisciplinarity. Um, and, and you can do that in so many facets of your life. And so I would say as a new grad, the way in which I came to my current career was not necessarily by finding a job description, like, oh, all of these things that I now do are there. Um, it was a lot of you know, volunteering of my time that then led to other types of positions and expertise. It was, um, following my passions and, and being involved in things that um, maybe weren't in my job description, but eventually build a, built a skill set that now makes me, um, you know, very much, much sought after in my field. So, so yeah, I, I would encourage folks to follow your passions, to think outside the box. And um, as an early career scientist, a lot of, unfortunately, I think we're getting better, but unfortunately, a lot of your time is going to, you um, be expended in voluntary and vo voluntary and volunteer capacities. But I, if my experiences is any testament, um, it will pay off in the long run um, if you can if you can bear with it in the in the interim. Thank you. That's great advice. I think. Um, so let's see. Um, sorry, I'm just scrolling through the questions. Um, a lot of these are for, you know, anyone who would like to answer. Um, one of them is, as GIS is getting more attention, especially due to COVID-19, what advice would you have for current IT professionals that want to go into GIS or explore careers in GIS? This, Sienna. So um, that's actually not a bad idea. Um, and I'd also encourage them not to um, put away their IT skills because they will definitely need it to complement their GIS skills. So what I'll say is if you are genuinely interested in it and you know that no matter what you can stay in it, I'll say you can go ahead to start learning it. You start with the basics and understanding exactly what GIS is and kind of getting a sense of how to think geographically because that's very important. You can understand the software, but if you can't drink, sorry, if you can't think geographically, it's a little difficult to make insights and spatial analysis. So I would say you first have to kind of add it up to your old skill. Don't forget your old skill, and also try to um, think about things geographically, and also to go into it if you really feel that you that's the field you want to go into. So that's just all, that's just something that I'd like to add. Yeah, this is Barbara again. I might just add to that because I, I think Sienna's absolutely right. And that's just, um, if you're going to do it, still keep an eye open for the broader related issues, you know, so whether it's the protection of personal privacy, you know, because you're combining different data sets, neither of which, both of which might have, you know, been protected, but by combining them, they no longer are protected. 
uh, or the indigenous issues that related issues that Kelsey talked about there there are other policy implications of that work and I would just say it's it's not just about you know kind of the ones and the zeros you know or the the maps there are there are related issues and so always keep an eye open for those as well thanks thank you that was great um so there was a question I think that um, for Kelsey, let me just find that one. Sorry, I'm. Um, so this one is for Kelsey. Can you explain how you best decide the sort of data that must be collected in order to do an effective action plan? That is an awesome question. So at the regional level, um, that was about ooh, two and a half to three years of consensus building workshops um, across um, different jurisdictions, so including tribes, uh, state agencies, federal agencies, and fishery management council entities, as well as uh, public listening sessions where we were working with the public and with um, stakeholders uh, including environmental NGOs, industry, uh, other um, stakeholders in the region to determine what types of uh, data layers are important to include not only in the portal, but then to inform our decision making for an ocean action plan. Um, so that did, that then led us to the to conduct a regional ocean assessment. So sort of creating a, um, a baseline uh, data catalog that then informed um, in, informed additional data layers that were included in the Marco portal. Um, we had a new administration that came in in 2017. So a lot of our work prior to 2017 has been um, revised. I, I could say is the nicest way to put that. Um, uh, but we're still moving forward. And so the current data layers that are on the portal go through, again, a process of consensus building informed by uh, public and stakeholder input. We just had a forum on May 19th, which is usually in person, but this because of COVID went virtual where we were soliciting uh, stakeholder feedback in terms of uh, data layers and, and work plans and our projects in terms of regional ocean planning capacity. At a tribal level, what we did is these participatory GIS sessions. So we um, identified the state and federally recognized tribes in the mid-Atlantic region. That, there are over 29 um, at the time that we conducted the, the, our engagement process. And we went and we, we hosted listening sessions in the region with tribes. Uh, we went to, to tribal territories and, and reservations. We sat with environmental managers. We uh, we projected the portal onto whatever type of surface we had uh, to then uh, uh, have conversations about the data that was missing, the data challenges, what types of data they would like to see included. So it was a lot of having those on the ground conversations. And, and then we also identified some challenges, right? Challenges around what should be classified for, for open data use and challenges around uh, Zoom capabilities, right? A lot of our indigenous knowledge holders and elders were uh, pretty frustrated by the lack of, of spatial detail that they could get um, in terms of our current portal database um, and also just some of the more accessible federal data um, doesn't have the level of, of Zoom clarity that, that some of them were looking for. So thinking through some of those challenges from an indigenous perspective was um, all a part of the process. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, that was great. Um, so we just have a few more minutes. I'm going to um, put everybody's contact information up on the screen. So um, I think we could probably take one more question. Um, and I think that could be for everybody. Um, what is an action item that you would like to give to everyone attending? Uh, one action item that you would like people to take away from everyone attending? Well, this is Barb. <laughs> I'll start. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know what? Be be kind. <laughs> be kind to each other. Uh, particularly, you know, just uh, in vote, vote in uh, vote in November. Whatever way you vote, it's just important to engage and uh, and be gentle. Thanks, Kelsey or Sienna, Do you have any action items you want to highlight for our attendees? 
This is Kelsey. I would just say um, to please familiarize yourself with the uh, indigenous territory that you currently reside and, and occupy um, and, and in whatever capacity you can to advocate for, for social justice, um, racial justice, environmental justice, justice in general for all of our peoples because we really need it now more than ever. And I think a good first step in doing that, um, particularly from our perspective, both for indigenous sovereignty and black liberation, is to familiarize, familiarize yourself with the be fair uh, and care principles um, of indigenous data sovereignty and, and in particular to uh, understand international law by looking up and uh, reading the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and thinking through a data scientist lens and a geospatial lens, how you can uh, start to operationalize many of those articles from that international declaration in your work. Thank you. Thank you. Sienna, did you have any action items you'd like our audience to take away? Wow, okay. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> my message would be kind of directed to um, fellow Africans that if you want to enter into any STEM field, um, you definitely have to first discover yourself, as I said earlier, and know exactly what you want to get yourself into. Don't allow anyone to kind of change your mind if you have set your mind on something and you feel in your gut that that's what you want to do. For me, I did not know that I could combine GIS with business, but even though there was no awareness and there was, in fact, very low knowledge of GIS, I was still able to find my way around it because that's what I associated myself with and that's what I believed I could do. So first know yourself and stand by what exactly you want to do. Thank you, that's great advice. <laughs> Okay, well, that's all the time we have. Um, I'd like to thank our three presenters, Kelsey Leonard, Sianna Lena Williams, and Barbara Ryan for spending time with us today. Um, if we didn't get to your question or you'd like to contact one of our presenters separately, um, the contact information um, is up on the screen um, and we will forward questions to them directly if we didn't have time to get to it. Um, after the webinar, a survey is going to pop up and it will also be sent to all of our attendees via email. We would really appreciate it if you could take the time to give us feedback on your experience. It helps us a lot. Uh, I'd also like to thank Madeline Shuren and Margo Bordney for their help behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. Um, this definitely would not have worked without them. So thank you so much. Um, if you'd like to learn more about these women and the many other women using GIS, please take a look at our books. Uh, women in GIS. Uh, we have volume two and volume one. So all together, there's about 53 women that we've highlighted. They're available at your favorite online realtor. So go and uh, take a look, leave a five-star rating and show your support. Finally, we want to close with some resources on how we can support our black colleagues in the U.S., as well as our colleagues of African and Caribbean descent in the geospatial world right now. Black Girls Map and North Star are organizations that we encourage everyone to follow on social media and get involved with to help elevate black voices in our community. Again, thank you to everyone who attended, everyone who participated. Have a safe week. And please follow Esri social media for more information on upcoming events at our virtual user conference this year in July. Thank you.